Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Kingsway Church Sunday service on Sunday, the 21st of March 2021. It's hard to believe that next Sunday will be British summertime. Isn't that crazy to think that we're entering into the summertime after a long winter? I, for one, love to walk outside and uh, see the, the growth of the, the plants, the daffodils and and other lovely flowers around um, where I live. It's absolutely beautiful. It's nice to get out and to, to cut your grass for the first time and things like that. So it's great to see spring um, come along into the air. And next time when we meet, then the clocks will have sprang forward an hour. Just to, to bear that in mind. This morning, we will very soon hear some worship music. Isn't it wonderful? Just to come and praise the Lord this morning. It does wonders for your spirit just to praise him. God, it's wonderful to do. And we're also going to see some preaching from Steve McClurg as well. It's always great to hear Steve. He preaches with such vigour and such enthusiasm. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Steve later on. We're also going to hear um, an online um, missions report from um, Alexander who is a contemporary of Zoran Smarsky. And many of us have met Alexander whilst out in Macedonia, a lovely fella. And he is now living and serving the Lord out in Switzerland. So we'll hear a missions report from him um, shortly. If you would like any further information with regards to the missions that we have running in the church at the moment, feel absolutely free to contact Step. And he would be delighted to fill you in and give you more information about the mission. Seems to be we um, have missions in every country, beginning with an M, whether it's Myanmar, Macedonia, Malawi, etc. So if you want any further information, see Step, and he would be delighted to share that with you. And with regards the notices for this forthcoming week, on Thursday evening, 8pm, we have our prayer Zoom and Step will normally pop a little um, notification of the Zoom code and password, etc. in the church WhatsApp group. So look out for that coming. That's Thursday night at 8pm. Do try and get along to that event. Um, Any times that I go to it, I always feel refreshed and blessed. And I think it's a very, very good way to enter into the weekend. Now, I would like to encourage everyone um, on the upcoming week to Easter. Um, we are... Um, engaging in a week of prayer and fasting from Monday the 29th of March until the 2nd of April. So get involved in that and that, that week leading up to Easter of praying and, and fasting and meditating on, on God's word and on the Lord. It's time well spent um, on the build up to Easter. So I'm just going to pray and then we're going to hand it over to the guys then for the worship. Okay. Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for another opportunity to come and to connect with brothers and sisters, Lord, online. Lord, we look forward to the day that uh, that we can meet each other again in person, Lord, without any restrictions. But Father, we are um, very grateful indeed that we can come together via technology and, and meet virtually, Lord. It's a real blessing. Father, I ask that you're hand would be upon Steve this morning as he preaches, Lord, that his word would give life to the whole congregation, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the worship team would would encourage and stir our hearts, Lord. I pray that you would just bless those guys, Father. Lord, I pray that you would bless the work of uh, all of our missions, Lord, across the world, Lord. And I ask Lord, that you would really bless Alexander as he ministers out in Switzerland, Father. Lord, I help, pray that you would help us all focus on prayer and meditation, Lord, in your word, Lord, and just fast, Father. Pray that you'd be with us, Lord. Bless us and encourage us this week, Father. In your precious name we ask it. Amen. Well, guys, I hope you enjoy the service. Take care and be blessed. Good morning, everybody. I am going to read you a story today called I Knew You Could. And it's a little bit ripped in places, a little bit worn, 
but it's a lovely story about a train and I hope you like it. I knew you could and you knew it too, that you'd come out on top after all you've been through. And from here you'll go farther and see brand new sights, you'll face brand new hills that rise to new heights. I wish I could show you the stops that you'll visit, but that isn't my choice to make for you, is it? Instead, I can tell you some lessons and tales that I've learned and relearned on my time on the rails. First of all, you must find your own track so you can start right away and not be held back. But which track is yours? Well, that all depends on which way it's going and where it might end. Different tracks wind around, over, under, and through. So pick out the one that works best for you. Though the track you start out on will feel like the one, you might take a few more before you are done. And now with your eyes on your new destination, start up your wheels and roll out of the station. On your new trip, you'll make plenty of stops in deep river valleys and on high mountain tops. Some will surprise you and some will be planned and you'll roll through each one saying, I think I can. You'll go through dark tunnels surrounded by dark and you'll wish for a light or even a spark. You might get scared or a little bit sad wondering if maybe your track has gone bad. So here's some advice to help ease your doubt. The track you took in must also go out. So steady yourself and just keep on going. Before you know it, some light will be showing. And then you'll be out heading to a new place. You'll be ready for the next tunnel you face. Sometimes you'll look up and see planes in the sky and you'll think to yourself, I wish I could fly. The cars and the roads will seem quick and free. You'll feel stuck on your track and think, I wish that was me. But the plane might wish he could get out of the air, saying, I wish I could travel like that train down there. The cars will watch as you speed right along and they'll say to each other, look how fast and how strong. Don't worry about not being a car or a plane, just enjoy the trip you'll take as a train. Don't be afraid to toot your own horn if you need to be heard or there are people to warn. Or if being yourself just makes you so proud that you want to share it and sing it aloud. You'll follow your tracks through twists and through bends and stop at new stops and pick up new friends. They'll all come aboard with smiles and greetings and you'll have such great times with the people you're meeting. On the days when you're sad and feel you can't go, speak up and ask a friend for a tow. That's what friends do, so don't be afraid. You do the same if your friend needed aid. You might stop at some stops that you never have toured and look for new friends, but they won't come aboard. So you'll have to head out with a creak and a groan, setting out once again on your track all alone. Try to remember that the world is so wide, full of all kinds of people with their own trains to ride. Just stay true to yourself as you travel your track with no second guessing and no looking back. Once you're on the right track, you'll probably say, this one is mine, I'm here to stay. Try to enjoy the track that you choose, stop now and then to take in the views. If you rush forward as a general rule, before you arrive, you could run out of fuel. Don't overwork, but save up some strength. That way every day you can travel great lengths. Looks quite tired, doesn't he? You'll need all the strength on the days when you're stuck or tired or sad or just out of luck. When your belief in yourself doesn't feel quite so pure and your I think I can doesn't sound quite so sure. That's when the push and the strive and the strain to show the world you're not a given up train and you're wise if you know that doing your best means that sometimes you should just slow down and rest. Speeding through your whole trip will bring only sorrow. So slow down today to be happy tomorrow. There's more about life that you'll learn as you go because figuring things out on your own helps you grow. Just trust in yourself and you'll climb every hill. Say, I think I can and you know what? You will.
gracious and astounding God's love so confounding appears to us in a cleansing flow of blood sun left throne and glory more the father's wrath and fury in our stead For the sins of man he bled Standing on worship Raise a voice and worship Come adore The King of kings and lords Lamb of heaven, he was dead, but God raised him from the grave. His arm is mighty to save. Now glorified and reigning. of death and Hades in his hand. All hail the Lord of every man. Standing on worship, raise a voice and worship, come adore. King of kings and the Lord of lords, this is our God forever. So standing on worship, King Jesus, raise a voice and worship, come adore. The King of kings and the God raised him from the grave For his arm is still mighty to save Now glorified and reigning King Jesus The keys of death and Hades in your hand Lord of every man, standing on worship, raise a voice and worship, come adore the King of kings and the Lord of Raise a voice and worship, come adore King of kings and the Lord of lords You deserve the glory and the honor we lift our hands in worship and we bless your holy name you deserve the glory and the honor we lift our hands in worship 
And we bless your holy name, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You deserve the glory and the honor. We lift our hands in worship and we bless your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship and we bless your holy name. For you are great, you do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. For you are great, you do miracles so great. And there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. Good morning, everybody. One of the many benefits of preaching through whole books of the Bible, rather than where a preacher is allowed to jump from one favorite theme and passage to another, is that the teacher is forced to confront hard passages and to grow. This is all the Word of God, this Bible, and it is all profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Today is one of those harder passages. A baby is born blind and suffers for decades until he meets Jesus, who has had an arranged appointment with this fellow since before this man's conception, so that Jesus might show off the works of God and heal him. One of the reasons I love the Bible and believe the Bible is because it does deal with the hardest things in life. It doesn't sweep painful things under the rug, complex, confusing, provoking, shocking, even controversial things. In fact, Jesus, I think, went out of his way to create controversy, such as in this passage we're going to be dealing with in John chapter 9. He healed a man on the Jewish Sabbath and didn't wait until Monday. He did it on Saturday. Okay, let's begin. Hear the word of the Lord. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who had been born blind. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but that it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must carry out the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spit on the ground and made mud from the saliva and applied the mud to his eyes and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, Siloam which is translated sent. So he left and washed 
and came back seeing. Now this miracle in John 9 is the sixth of seven miracles John the Apostle chose out of thousands he could have cited so that you and I and whosoever wills might come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing we might have life in his name. One of the hardest things in life is to watch when children and families suffer for whatever reason. And especially when that suffering stretches out for a lifetime of suffering and loss. Few things in the ministry God gave to Gina and me has given us deeper satisfaction than co-founding a medical organization in North Africa. In that work, we established a series of physical therapy centers across the country where we lived that treated very young disabled children and trained their parents how to, to help them. A disabled ministry very similar to ours has a vision statement which captures the essence of our thinking and theology when it comes to disabled children. This is their vision statement and ours. Our vision is that we would display the greatness and the goodness of God in disability and suffering. We want our lives to reflect an unshakable joy in the Lord that allows us to embrace a life of suffering in disability for his purpose and glory. We want to shout that life with a disability and with Jesus is infinitely better than a healthy body without him. We say with Paul that this momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. Are disabilities in children a hard thing? You bet. In our setting, we dealt most often with the side effects of cerebral palsy, CP. But there was also autism, Down syndrome, spina bifida, blindness, and a whole bunch of other strange childhood conditions, all of which turned life for whole families upside down. Marriage and family life was suddenly pulled into the black hole of these children's disabilities. And it's usually long term. And no one asked their permission. Now, the Bible is filled with things that, that God says and does to shed life on suffering and sorrow. For those of us who shepherd souls in any ways, the elders, our counselors, Gene and me, a lot of you, what would we do if the Bible had nothing to say to these kids and parents who suffer? But thank God it does. The Bible's permeated, it's pregnant with, with suffering and sorrow and hope. Look with me at verse 1 in the passage. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man born or blind from birth. He was born blind and now he's a man, and it has not gone easily for him. We're going to meet, or we would meet, or will meet his parents later in the chapter, and it's clear that they aren't able to care for him any longer. That's why he's a desperately poor beggar, or a per beggar for some of you. Life has been very hard. And note this, the passage says that Jesus saw him as he passed by. The story doesn't begin with the disciples' question, but when Jesus sees the man blind from birth. I want to urge all of us that we choose to see people with disabilities. It's against my natural inclination to see, but rather to avoid. But we are not natural, are we? We are followers of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's inside of us, and we are not to respond like everyone else. Why? Because at one time, you and I were broken, blind, and dead in our trespasses and sins, and Jesus saw us, and he touched us in his mercy. Oops. If you want to be one of the most remarkable humans on the planet, the Jesus kind of man and woman, then see people with disabilities. See them and move toward them and bless them. God will show you what to say. Then what happened? Verse 2. When the disciples saw Jesus looking at the blind man, 
They then asked for an explanation for why he was blind. They said, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now, this is probably not the most tactful or kind thing to say in the moment, particularly and probably in the man's hearing. You and I also stick our foot in our mouths when talking with the disabled and their families. But Jesus is merciful to his disciples, just like the parents of children with disabilities are, when well-meaning people say ill-informed and insensitive things. And the Lord redeems those awkward moments and callous words. Look how Jesus answers in verse 3. He says, It was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, there is purpose in this blindness. And this was it. The works of God would be manifest in him. Jesus answers their question, note, but not in the categories that they're using. They want an explanation for this man's blindness in terms of cause. Who's to blame for this situation? He sounds like Americans looking for someone to blame and to sue for anything in our culture there. Jesus assigns no blame. He assigns no cause, but explains in terms of purpose, not cause, that the works of God might be displayed in him. No cause, just purpose. If he'd wanted, Jesus could have correctly gone to Genesis 3 or Romans 5, 12 or Romans 8, 18 to 25 and told them that if Adam and Eve had not introduced sin into the world, there never would be suffering. And that's true. Jesus is not denying that. But what Jesus is saying here is this. Specific suffering is often not due to specific sin. In fact, I would say this is true most of the time. Oh, you can sometimes make a link. Uh, a lifetime drunkard suffer, suffers from cirrhosis of the liver, or a bomb maker uh, blows off his hand while making explosives and suffers through life with only one hand. But generally, according to Jesus, we cannot assign a cause for people's suffering, and certainly not for this blind man's suffering. Rather, Jesus says to look for an explanation for this kindness, this blindness in God's purposes, that the works of God might be displayed in him. The explanation of the blindness lies not in past causes, but in future purposes that God planned. There are a lot of people who don't like this idea. Some Bible teachers don't like the idea that God might have willed that a child be born blind so that some purpose of God later might be achieved. One of the ways they try to avoid this teaching of this text is to say that Jesus is pointing to the result of the blindness and not the purpose of the blindness. In other words, Jesus came across this blind guy and was able to redeem the situation so as to show off his work, but not that he actually planned the blindness in order to show his work. Here are three reasons why I think that logic is off the mark. Number one, the disciples are asking for an explanation for the blindness, and Jesus delivers. Not in the category of cause, but God's purpose. If they say that there is, if you say that there was no purpose or plan or design in the blindness, and that Jesus simply finds the blind fellow later and decides to use it as a showcase, then Jesus is not answering the question of why he was born blind. Number two, God knows everything. He knows exactly what is happening in the moment of conception, when there is an additional 21st chromosome or some genetic irregularity in the sperm that is about to fertilize that egg. God could simply say no. He commands the wind and the waves and every subatomic particle in the cosmos. He commands the sperm and the genetic makeup of the egg. If God foresees and permits a conception that he knows will produce blindness, he has reasons for this permission. And those reasons are his purposes, his design, his plans. God never has made or met a child 
for whom he had no plan. There are no accidents in God's mind or hands. The third reason. Any attempt to deny God's sovereign, wise, and purposeful control over conception and birth runs head-on into passages like Exodus 4.11 and Psalm 139.13. The Lord said to Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute and deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord Yahweh? And you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. This is sobering, I know it. But the meaning of Jesus in 9.3 of John is clear. He's saying to his disciples, turn away from your fixation on fault and blame as the decisive explanation for suffering. And to us in the 21st century, he would add, do not surrender to futility, absurdity, chaos theory, and the meaninglessness of Darwinistic mechanisms of purposeless random mutation. Instead, two responses. We need to embrace the purposes and plans of God, that there is no child and no suffering outside of God's purposes. Each one is precious and within his plan. Number two. We need to bow and worship and tremble. As this blind man does at the end of John chapter 9, and say along with Job to the sovereign God who is always gracious, always kind, always just and wise, you can do all things and no purposes of yours can be thwarted. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I repent in dust and ashes. This isn't all that the Bible has to say in terms of meaning of suffering. Uh, this is true. Of, uh, uh, there are dozens of other passages and important points to make, but this passage and this point are really important. The suffering can only have ultimate meaning in relation to him. That is true. This is true of all suffering. How do you and I deal with that? Well, God must be, be the most important and valuable thing in our lives. More valuable than health and life. David would agree in Psalm 63 when he said, Your loving kindness is better than life. And so much of the Bible makes no sense unless God is cherished by you above anything else. Okay. John 9 in that chapter, God intends to display some of his glory through this blindness. In this case, that glory happens to be in healing, the glory of God's power to heal. But there's nothing in the passage that says it has to be healing. Do you remember 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where Paul cried out three times, the great apostle, for his thorn in the flesh to be healed? And what did Jesus tell him? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, I will put my power on display, not by healing you, but by sustaining you. And so healing displays the works of God in John 9 and is displayed in sustaining grace in the work of God in 2 Corinthians 12. What is common in both cases is that the ultimate value is the glory of God. The blindness is for the glory of God. The thorn in the flesh is for the glory of God. The healing is for the glory of God. And the non-healing for the glory of God. Listen, I believe in the supernatural gift of healing and faith. It's in the Bible. I've seen miracles both on and off the mission field. I believe we should be praying all the time for healing. For every, everyone and everywhere where we find the sick. I've asked the elders to come and pray for me soon for a particular physical need that I have. As it instructs us in James 5, they're going to anoint me with oil. I'm going to confess my sins to the Lord, and they're going to pray the prayer of faith. And I believe the Bible in Isaiah 53 and, and 1 Peter 2 when it tells us, by his stripes we are healed for all who are God's people eventually. 
Suffering can only have ultimate meaning in our relationship to God, in relation to God. Just a few quick points I have not addressed so far in this passage. Verse 5, Jesus says, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I think he's pointing out that while this blind man will soon see the Pharisees with whom he's, they're going to argue for about 28 verses later in this chapter are the blind ones to the fact that Jesus was light and life. It also looks back to chapter 8 where Jesus, while at the Feast of Booths, standing up on the last day of the feast at the foot of, of four enormous 75-foot candelabras which are illuminating the, the sky of Jerusalem, And he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then in verse 6, why does Jesus spit on the ground and make a clay dirt potion uh, to put on the man's eyes? Well, it was both, I think, a, a purposeful affront to the Pharisees' notion of Sabbath and not tilling the soil on that day. As well, I'm convinced that Jesus is once again, as he does elsewhere in the Gospel of John, clearly making a claim that he is God, doing again what he did as creator back in Genesis 2-7 when he created Adam from the dirt of the ground. And verse 7, why the instruction that the man bathe in the pool of Siloam? Siloam? I'm not sure, but I suspect that Jesus is inviting the man to participate in his own healing, to be obedient in response to Jesus' offer of healing and of life. And one last observation in verse 4. Jesus says, We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. This means two things, I think. One is that the works of God, referred to in verse 3, were being done through the hands of Jesus. Jesus will heal this man's blindness, and the works of God are the works of Jesus. Number two, Jesus says that he must do it quickly, because night is coming and his work will be over. Jesus will turn from the ministry of healing in the day to the ministry of dying in the night. He will turn from the day work of relieving suffering and do the night work of suffering himself. He will submit himself totally to the plan of his Father that the Son be consumed by the sin and suffering of the world. And looking at the cross, we could easily join the disciples in asking the question, who's to blame for this, for this suffering? And the answer, of course, Jesus would say, it wasn't me. It was you, for you and I are the cause of his suffering. But that's not the best explanation for the cross. The best explanation is that Jesus suffered so that the works of God might be displayed in Jesus. The work of bearing God's wrath, removing our curse, lifting our guilt, providing our righteousness, defeating our death, giving us life, and in the end, removing our suffering completely and forever. At which time, Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And over every sorrow and every disability, and every loss which was embraced in faith for the glory of God will be written in his blood this, that this momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. By comparison, as we look not at the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are passing but the things that are unseen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Father, give to us capacity to see the display of your works in your son's suffering and our suffering and our children's suffering as purposeful and as expressions of your love. In Jesus' name, amen.